it, I think it would be hard to find someone who doesn't sing or hum or whistle or tap on something throughout the day. I think there's something there. If, we're, if everyone's doing it, like breathing is important, music must be important too. I was living in a way where I had to succeed as an artist. Mm. I absolutely had to succeed as an artist to feel like my life was valuable, to, uh, to seeing the world more as um, this is the station God has placed me in. Mm. To what the place he is, he's placed me to to live and to do good in the world. And uh, if if this is it, really, like like just like the scenario in the book, if this is it, um, I I will find some way to live a good life. Noah, you know a lot of people are gonna love your voice, and a lot of people are gonna hate your voice. <laughs> you know, there's no in between, and that scared that scared me a lot. Um. You can always aim at, at something, at making things around you better, or you can make things around you just a little bit more like hell. Hey, yeah, I don't want to scare anyone away, but maybe I just shouldn't care. And... and the point being is that you're writing your book, you're excited, but no one cares. Mm. Really, no one cares. What's up, Legends? Today we have a highlight episode from two of my favorite guests and peers and influential people in my life, my brother Nick Sherman and a good friend Noah Cauley, two of the creative, most creative people I know, and uh, making something, let alone making something of yourself, is um, a difficult and challenging endeavor, even uh, in the context that we're in just here locally. And so today you're going to hear from two creators whose thoughts are very complimentary, very eye-opening as far as what it takes to create something of value, to create something that other people care about, and um, like enrich the audience that you're speaking to, or singing to, or creating for, writing for. Hope you enjoy it, and it helps you on your own journey to uh, fuel your own small-town success story. New Local Legends Podcast. <laughs> Real small town success stories. We have quite the lineup. We believe that if people know better, they can do better. When you kiss me by the river. Welcome to the Speakeasy. The amount of love and compassion. The hope that's been bubbling up in the last few years. The finer things about Portland. You just don't see that everywhere. Local legends only. Local songwriter, producer, musician, Noah Colley. What's up, man? Hey. Welcome to the podcast, bro. Thanks, man. You know, I have so many people to thank for, like, bringing these small town success stories to life. But um, when it comes to making the podcast sound better, just the overall quality of the production, I have you to thank in the the forefront, my man. So, I mean, you've been um, just since day one just uh, giving me critiques and uh, some helpful criticism just have been overall my most influential peer in making this thing sound better every episode and I want to thank you for that so sure thing. yeah Happy to help. Uh, this is uh, Connor Sherman I'm in the Glockner speakeasy with my brother Nick Sherman how's it going <laughs> I loved your book thank super you. super excited about it the, the feedback has been uh, much more positive than I could have anticipated mm. you can um, well, it was it was really fun to write, but when other people care about it as much as it seems like you care about it, then uh, there's just good conversations happen. It's, it's been very pleasant. Yeah, 
in school, my, my music teacher, Eric Brown, who I, I love to death, you know, um, he told me as soon as we, like, I, it wasn't very long into our, like, you know, our friendship and him teaching me that he said, you know, you know, a lot of people are going to love your voice and a lot of people are going to hate your voice, <laughs> you know, there's no in between. And that scared, that scared me a lot. Um, I don't know. It, it kind of made a complex in me that made me scared of my voice and dislike my voice in a lot of ways. Um, and it made me scared to perform and to show people and sing to people. Um, but now it's, it's I, I'm not scared of it anymore and I, I think it's probably a good thing. My, my uh, guy, Bo Clary, he is, goes under a pseudonym in the book, but uh, he originally gave me this, or I was telling him, man, Bo, I just can't finish books. Like, I just get distracted. I don't know if it's my attention span. And he just told me, Nick, you are just not reading good enough books. Mm. And and I was like, okay. I mean, sure, like, seems like a simple thing, whatever. He, he gave me this 800-page book, this 800 pages. <laughs> and... And I was like, thank you, Bo. I'm like, do I have to return this? And he said, no, just keep it. This, this like, is good for you. This will be good for you. And uh, I, I read it, the whole thing. That is, like, the biggest, honest to goodness, besides Harry Potter, a Harry Potter book when I was young, just on a whim. Yeah. And now that I think about it, those two things correlate because they were just things I was really interested in or questions I was trying to ask. Um, it's funny how intrinsic that is to like people, you know, it, 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 I think it would be hard to find someone who doesn't sing or hum or whistle or tap on something throughout the day. Right. You know? At least I think that's hard to find that person who doesn't do that at least once throughout the day. And there's something there that's important, mm -hmm. like that we can there, there's a desire in us to like shape the sound and the silences in the sound and like put them together and then make something from that that right. expresses our feelings at the time or or just carries us out of boredom or whatever it is mm. i think there's something there if we're if everyone's doing it at least once like breathing is important music must be important too it's like deeply connected to people's sense of well-being and like in areas like ours maybe it is um, the first spark uh, to start a serious flow of capital or um, just create opportunity in the surrounding area you see mm -hmm. that with people like Robert Black and what he's doing with uh, yeah. the bony fiddle um, project is that when the historic district was really kind of in collapse uh, music was a big part of kind of that wind of change, you know. It, anyway, the, the start of the book was an experience I had with Tim Sherman, my father. I, I went up to this, this apartment complex to work with him because I needed the money and I was too afraid to get a normal, uh, just a, a typical job, a humbling job around here, and also be a graphic designer. That's the honest truth. So I went up to work with, with Tim Sherman at this apartment complex. I was just doing day labor, and uh, it was it was pretty... The, the guys that I, around, uh, I was around weren't exactly shooting for the stars. <laughs> it, so it, it um, yeah, that informed a lot of the experience. The book is called Dead End Job, and the subtitle, it talks about... Uh, the tragic story of an artist who will never leave his soul-crushing day job, ever. And uh, I think that's just the question that, like, people, uh, new students, students who just graduate, they get a job that's not in their field or whatever, that's kind of the uh, the fear, is that what if I'm stuck here forever? We have all asked ourselves that, yeah, that, that sure. question. What if I'm stuck here forever? Like, Or is, 
is this the limit of my potential? And so I just wanted to play that out in a way that it was like, what if, what if you really were stuck there forever, like because of some evil or ancient force, or, or what if you were really stuck there for eternity? Like, how would that change you, and how would that, would that corrupt your soul, or would that mm, make you transcend somehow? You know? Yeah. And uh, so, so for me personally. That, that job changed my entire worldview. It, 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 it completely shook me. Uh, where it, whereas I was living in a way where I had to succeed as an artist. Mm. I absolutely had to succeed as an artist to feel like my life was valuable, to, uh, to seeing the world more as um, this is the station God has placed me in. Mm. To what the place he is, he's placed me to, to live in, to do good in the world. And uh, if if this is it, really, like like just like the scenario in the book, if this is it, um, I I will find some way to live a good life, you know. And that's like super melodramatic. I mean, I was just getting a job with my, <laughs> you know, working out of college, or whatever. But but uh, I, my mind tends to think in the extremes. So uh, it it was just a uh, I came to enjoy it actually. Mm. I came to enjoy the uh, that no one cared that you like came from an arts background. Everybody was super self-deprecating about that, or poked at you, sure. or, or like, ah, you're here with us, you know, you'll never leave, <laughs> you're gonna die here, you know, and and uh, that was kind of fun in the end, you know. Sure. The, it, I was still learning during the process of of producing it and and coming up with the ideas that are in it. Um, it was all learning nonstop and trying new things and they just happened to be what I wanted or that I didn't even know I wanted sometimes. And um, now, now that it's done, there's a little bit of um, self-denial here where I'm trying to like keep myself at bay and say, hold up this project isn't done you know mm -hmm. don't get ahead of yourself and don't jump off this train and get onto another train yet you kind of have to stick with the same thing so that the, the next two EPs uh, are cohesive in sound mm -hmm. um, so there's that but then I am was the last minute addition it was literally um, I don't know maybe three weeks before release Mm. Um, I decided it, I wanted that in it, that, that piece of the story in it. So I went um, and created it. And um, I found something that I didn't know I wanted. And it was that more, like, maybe I just let myself um, be more free. And I really liked it. Mm. And um, I want more of that freedom. and the risk of um, scaring people into thinking I am a strange ritualistic uh, chanting Indian in the <laughs> foothills of Portsmouth. You sure they give off that vibe, no? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't want to scare anyone away, but maybe I just shouldn't care. And uh, I am just kind of set a, pre a new precedent for me um, and showed me that I can do things that I didn't think I could do. Um, I'll tell you something that really, really influenced me in how to write this. It was uh, this this book called from Stephen Pressfield, who wrote The War of Art. And Connor Connor likes The War of Art. Yeah, post, absolutely. Post some stuff about it, but he also wrote this book called uh, No One Wants to Read Your Shit. And and the whole premise of it is that Stephen Pressfield used to work in advertising before he wrote like The Legend of Badger Vance or The War of Art or like literature, you know. Uh -huh. He used to be in advertising, and he said that uh, the, these advertising execs they'd ha always have products to sell, and the clients would come in, and the clients would have their product, and they like the clients would think their product was like the most exciting thing that was ever going to hit the market, you know. And that the advertising execs would like play to that, just be like, oh yeah, it's gonna be great, whatever. And as soon as the clients left, they'd be like, okay, how are we gonna sell this piece of crap? Like, how are we gonna sell it? And the point being is that you're writing your book, you're excited, but no one cares. Mm. Really, no one cares. Because, uh, and it's not even a personal thing, it's just that we read the things that, like, 
we uh, we read the things to try to get answers to the questions we have. You know, so it's just a, a matter of relevance. There are so many words like you're you're not going to pick up and read a book in a pleasant way unless unless you really care about the answers that it's giving you. You know, sure. so I like I'm a hundred percent serious when when I say like when people are like Nick, I know you wrote a book and I, and and. I almost encourage people not to read it because I, I know that <laughs> I know that if they're not uh, I don't want I want someone to actually like the book. Sure. I really do. Not from a place of like I need it to propagate my ego, just like if this is what they're looking for, if they want to explore like what it would mean to have a dead end job that would last forever, like <laughs> yeah. how would that change them? Great. Like like that's what you're uh, that's what you're looking for. So when you hear your music, Noah, if I was um, the kid that like grew up in New Boston or whatever and heard you as an artist that's come out of that same area wondering like how you get to that step it's probably like initially very awe-inspiring but also intimidating if they actually tried to start right yeah um, sure so you just go in step by step by that is uh, is really cool sure it might sound complicated but you can do it it's not like impossible it's not out of your reach for any any artist um maybe financially I know it's tough um, at points but the the actual doing of it uh, when it comes down to the, the processing and the the all the plugins and the making the, the getting the EQs and the compression and the reverbs and all that stuff YouTube it buy a book if you need to um, it's it's not as daunting of a thing as you think you can start off not doing complex things and it still sounds good yeah and I would definitely add to that by saying that the time that we live in now uh, even being in a small town like 50 years ago you probably wouldn't have been able to you wouldn't have been able to put together a project like this on your own independently Um, it just wouldn't be possible you'd have to go to a studio you'd have to um, rent equipment like you wouldn't be able to order it on Amazon or whatever you know it's just like so many more variables now we've kind of been unleashed with this new uh, affordable tech that's been made available uh, available to us to really just focus on being creative you know we've just been born in a digital time and I have to remind myself of that and, and that's why I uh, just enjoy diving back in history and learning about my family and the generations before me and just realizing that we have it pretty easy right now you know, there's a, there's a lot of things just widely available to us at low cost to make our dreams come true kind of thing. Yeah, yeah I'm not an outlier here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's plenty of ind- independent artists doing the same exact thing. Mm-hmm. So it, it's definitely available. It's, it's, it's there for you to use. I think that's where the freedom the the freedom is most present is the idea that you always can do good you always can do uh now you can debate about what good is or how you get there but but uh you can always aim at at something at making things around you better or you can make things around you just a little bit more like hell you mm-hmm.